Shabbat Shalom, everybody. So many of you sitting here know that I joined a group of over 20 rabbis to fly to Israel to spend about three days there to visit, to hear, to bear witness, to hug, to bring things with us, some of them tangible, most of them intangible. And I want to share with everybody here some of my impressions, my sense based on what I observed of what the mood is right now in Eretz Yisrael, a little bit about some of the larger questions that we're all grappling with. And I'll give some of the highlights and then see if I can suggest what all of this might mean. So we arrived at Ben Gurion Airport. All of us who have flown into Israel know that the airport is usually Balagan. It's overflowing, it's crazy. People are coming and going and you can barely hear yourself. The airport was so quiet that it made us nervous. Very few flights are going in and going out. And we gathered ourselves and we took the bus to the first stop, which was a place where Achim Leneshech, brothers and sisters in arms, were gathering goods that were donated from all over the world, that were brought to Israel through a variety of means to be given to soldiers, to be given to people who were displaced from their homes. Achim Leneshech, this is the group that two months ago was protesting the Israeli government protesting the judiciary reforms. And this same group who are um, extraordinarily patriotic citizens of Israel gathered themselves to oversee the collecting and the distribution of everything that needs to be done, stepping into a void that was left and which they filled. Second stop. We went to a place that has become the headquarters in Tel Aviv for families of those who have been taken captive, Khatufim. And we heard from one individual, her name is Ayelet Shahar, whose daughter Naama has been taken captive into Gaza. And she started by saying, I don't want this publicity. She's a physician, she's a sports physician. And she just wants her daughter and the other captives to come home. She said, my daughter is 19 years old. We've traveled as a family. She loves international travel. She's interested in pursuing a career in diplomacy. And at one point she said, you know, we don't always agree, she's 19 years old. She often will tell me I should be doing things differently and she has criticism with what I said and did and didn't say and didn't do. And she said, not a minute goes by that I don't want the door to our apartment to open. And in walks Naama with a whole long list of things that she's angry with me about. And she asked us please to pray for Naama Bat Ayelet. So I'm turning to all of us in addition to all of the hostages for whom we are praying, keep Naama Bat Ayelet in your prayers. Day two, we headed south to see some of the communities that experienced the ravages of October 7th and days following. And it was a little bit jarring it's not often that I'm given a helmet or a, a, a vest to wear and signing a release form and everything else. But of course, far, far, far more jarring than any of that was what we actually witnessed. We were taken to Kfar Aza, which is one of the kibbutzim that was breached and where massacres occurred. And the spokesperson from the IDF said, just look around. And we said, can we take pictures? He said, please take pictures. And so the beginning 
part of the kibbutz, the eastern part, looked like a normal kibbutz, lush with trees and vegetation. And as we got further west, close to the border of Gaza, which is three miles from the kibbutz. So I looked to make sure this is accurate. I believe that Great Neck South Middle School is three miles from here. So that gives you an idea of how close the kibbutz is. So the western part of the kibbutz looked like a war zone, homes that were completely burnt, blood still on the walls, spray painting that said, Mechablim Po, terrorists are here, clothing that was all over the place, the morning's breakfast still sitting out on the kitchen counters. And we took pictures, we paused. As we were leaving, we noticed the sukkah that, of course, was still up because the massacre occurred on the final day of Sukkot. So here you have the clothing, the food, all of the signs of life and also so much death. And it was a massacre. There is no other word that can be used to describe what happened there and other kibbutzim. And then we went to Ofakim, a little bit further east, where Hamas terrorists opened fire in the streets to kill as many people as they could. And the person who gave us a tour of the streets where this took place said, during the hours when the army didn't yet arrive and the police didn't yet arrive, he said, Am Yisrael stood up. The people of Israel stood up. Yossi across the street came out with his pistol and started shooting against people who were carrying machine guns. You know, Chaim next door took out his pistol and did the best that he could, and they were successful at killing a number of the terrorists. And then we headed back north, and we stopped at the Shura army base, where, among other things, uh, they have the morgue where the bodies are identified. And one individual who is part of Miluim, part of the reserves, he said his task has been to treat a number of these bodies. So first they have to determine who are civilians, who are Israeli soldiers, and who are the terrorists, because their bodies are also brought there. And they go through a whole process of identification as best they can, and they have to decide, are we going to advise the families to see the body or not? And it's not always so clear. They do it on the basis of whether they feel it will be healthier emotionally for the family to see or healthier for them emotionally not to see. And this individual said, you know, I just went through it because it's what I had to do. I did it over and over and over again. I didn't even realize the emotional toll that it was taking on me. So my family back home said, should we include you in the Mishaberach? Should we pray for your well-being? And he said, oh, don't worry about me. I'm not on the front line. I'm fine. <laughs> and then he remembered, you know, in the Mishaberach, we pray for Rufuat HaGuf, healing of the body, and Rufuat HaNefesh, healing of the spirit. He said, I need that. Please, he said, include me in the Mishaberach prayer. And then we heard from another individual who's part of the crime unit and who painstakingly went through one after another. He said, I have a one-year-old at home. And he saw that. And he said, every now and then I lose it. And then I remind myself, you're not the story. Get back to work. And he said, you know, I can be sarcastic. And I'm an academic. And sometimes I intellectualize things. And he said, jokingly, he said, so 99.9% .9 of me isn't fully human. But the 0.01% has been very impacted by these horrors one after another. And as we were leaving, I walked up to him and I said, I said, can I hug the 0.01%? And he said, sure. So I gave him a hug. The third day, the final day highlights, uh, we met with President Herzog. So we went to Beit Hanasi to the president's house. 
And first his wife spoke to us, he was on a call, and then he came in and joined us. And they said to us, tell us what's going on first by you, what's going on in your communities. So people spoke about anti-Semitism on university campuses. Uh, we spoke about a lot of the Israelis that are coming here, displaced to the United States, and putting their children in Jewish schools and how to handle that. And he said to us, Yishakoach, you know, you also are fighting a fight. And he said, please make sure that people understand that Hamas is not just interested in taking down the Jewish people, they're interested in taking down democracy and civilization. If people don't understand that unless we defeat Hamas, they are next, then you need to help them to understand. We also went to Hadassah Hospital on Mount Scopus and saw the rehab department. And a few people spoke to us. One woman who routinely brings her nine children with her husband to army bases to celebrate Shabbat, an observant family. And they want their children to have that experience of doing chesed, of doing the mitzvah, of taking care of the soldiers. And the base that they went to was very close to Gaza, and she herself was attacked by terrorists, as were some of the others. And she was giving instructions to her husband. She is a nurse of how to apply pressure to her wounds. And thank God she survived and she's going through rehab as are a number of other people. So I wanna just share just a number of ways that this is having an impact before I conclude. So first a word about the toll that this is taking on Israelis. Um, they are still in trauma. There is no post-trauma yet for Israelis. They are in trauma. They haven't had the opportunity to mourn the over 1,000 people that were massacred. How do you wrap your brain and your heart and your soul around 243 people who are imprisoned by individuals that have proven time and again just how barbaric they are? How do you handle over 300,000 reservists that can't fight fires or farm farms or staff doctor's offices and legal offices. We stayed at the Dan Panorama Hotel in Jerusalem, and in addition to us, we were the minority, were many, many, many families that have been displaced from the south and from the north, and we talked to them, and some of them had family members who were murdered, and we said, do you have any idea when you're going back to your homes? They said, we don't know when, we don't even know if. And so kids are skipping around the lobby of the Dan Panorama Hotel with their electronic devices and just being kids, multi-generational families. So Israelis are in the midst of all of this, all of these traumas that require different energies and different strategies, and they're balancing all of it. Political issues have taken a back burner. There is on the surface a unity that Israel is experiencing that they haven't experienced recently. We heard criticisms of the government. Where were they? What happened? There are going to be a lot of questions that will be asked in due time. Some people are saying this means we can never negotiate with the Palestinians, and some are saying this means that we truly need to find ways to get back to the negotiating table with the Palestinians. Lots of disagreement about that. I want to say something about the resilience of the Israeli people, the resilience of what that individual in Ofakim said, Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. I met up with our dear friends who live in Ranana, a suburb of Tel Aviv. They came to Jerusalem and we spent some time together. And our friend Gabby said, I am on countless WhatsApp chats, and all people are doing is saying, there's a family that moved into Renana from the south or from the north, and they like this certain kind of food. Can anybody make 12 portions? And somebody would write back, got it. And then so-and-so family came from wherever, 
and their son is becoming bar mitzvah, and they need food for the kiddush, and can one of our synagogues host the boy on it? Done. Food and flowers and a bima opportunity for, for this child who prepared his haftorah and Torah reading and had no place to have his bar mitzvah. I want to just name, celebrate Chayalei Tzva Haganah Yisrael, the soldiers that are defending our people. I was thinking this morning that our children who are 28 and 30 and 32 are 10 years older than these soldiers. I think of them as adults, but still like emerging adults. 18-year-olds, and then all of the people who did their army service and were called back and are now on the front lines again, God bless them. It is extraordinary what they are doing. These are not bloodthirsty people. These are future doctors and lawyers and store owners and current doctors and lawyers and store owners that are just doing the best they can to defeat this enemy who seeks, as I said, not only the destruction of the Jewish people. And the final point that I just want to convey this morning is the importance of our support. Israelis don't sugarcoat. If they're not happy to see you, they're not going to say we're happy to see you. <laughs> Time and again, people said, thank you for coming. Thank you for the hug. Thank you for the bulletproof vests that you schlepped past customs and brought to here. Thank you for the letters from the children in your religious school that you brought. The soldiers do sit around and read these letters and they smile and they know that they're not alone. In this morning's Torah reading, we have the moment when the servant says, how am I going to know if I found the right person for Isaac? And he says, the one whom I ask for water, and she says, I'll give you water, and I'll also give your camels water, that's the right one. And the commentators say that what he was looking for was somebody who didn't just do what she was asked, but who did more. This is a time that calls upon us to not just do what we're asked, but to give more to think about what we're going to give and then try to give extra, whether that has to do with goods or financial resources or fighting the fight that needs to take place on college campuses and elsewhere throughout our country. We need to go lifnim mishurat hadin, even beyond what we're asked, even beyond what we initially believed that we should do. And I want to conclude with a story that I hope you can take with you in terms of the role that we can all play. In the center of Tel Aviv, there is a table that is set for the hostages with 243 places. It is a Shabbat table and their names are written on the placemats, and the table is set for them to return. And every day at five o'clock, the Masorti conservative rabbis that we traveled with, who serve congregations in Israel, would take turns leading prayers for the families of the captives and all who wanted to join and take part. And so we sang and we prayed. And there was a little bit of a talk a reflection that was given by Rabbi Chaya Rowan Baker by the dean of the rabbinical school of the Schechter Institute. She has two children who are serving in the army. She doesn't know where they are. She worries about them all the time. And she said she put out on a little group chat that she has with friends who are all over the world how she always feels guilty, like she's not doing enough, like she has to worry about them all the time. She can't let their guard down. She can't even go to sleep because what if something happens when she's sleeping? That very powerful sense that we can all relate to. And she said, I sent that out into the group. 
And then she heard back from a friend in Los Angeles. And she said to her, Chaya, I'm 10 hours behind you. When it's night by you, it's daytime by me. I'll take the night shift. You go to sleep. And I'll worry and I'll pray while you're sleeping. That's what our brothers and sisters in Israel need from us. They need us to take the shift that we can take. They need us to pray. They need us to worry. They need us to give. They need us to hug. We all need to continue to do what we can, and once we figure out what that is, to try to do even more. Hashem ozli amo yitain. Hashem yevarechet amo bashalom. May God give strength to God's people. May God bless God's people with peace. Let us pray for the strength of Am Yisrael. Let us hold out our hope for her one day to live in security and peace with her neighbors. Amen.